So the last video I made was my review on The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. And if you saw that video all the way, then you know that at the end I was talking about how there was really one aspect of the game that I personally just wasn't the biggest fan of, but I didn't want to talk about it in terms of like the flaws and things that I didn't like as a section of the review video, but instead I wanted to make its own dedicated video on that, so that's what we're going to be doing inside of this video. And the reason I did that was because the thing that I'm going to be talking about inside of this video doesn't really take away anything from Tears of the Kingdom itself. Like I still think the game on its own is a masterpiece, legendary and completely deserving of all the praise and is a very solid game of the year contender. But really the issue that I have that I'm talking about in this video is kind of just a personal thing for me that I wanted to share my thoughts on. But I know that it's not only exclusive to me either because I've talked to some friends who also feel the same way about this as well. And that's why I didn't want to make this video first and have people think that I hate the game or anything like that because I actually really love the game and if you want to hear all the stuff that I love about it and all the praise that I have to say about it, that's why you should definitely go ahead and check out that review video. Now real quick before I talk about Zelda, I just want to let you guys know that I am having a special giveaway where I'm giving away $55 in Nintendo eShop gift cards as a special thank you for all the support and helping me reach 55,000 subscribers. So if you guys are interested in winning a Nintendo eShop gift card for $55, all you gotta do is click the link below in the description or the pinned comment. It does end at the start of September so you don't have a lot of time so definitely click the link below if you want to have a chance to win. Alright so now to answer the question. What is my least favorite part about Tears of the Kingdom? And the answer is, it just doesn't really feel like a sequel to Breath of the Wild. Now hold on a second, before you start getting all angry and typing the mean comments at me, I hope you'll give me a chance to explain because I'm not talking about this in terms of gameplay or how the game is made or anything like that because fundamentally, like in terms of gameplay especially, it definitely does feel like a sequel to Breath of the Wild. A lot of quality of life changes, there's a lot of improvements to how stuff works in the game, even the world design seems to be way more expanded with the sky islands and the depths and everything. It definitely is a sequel in all of that. What I'm talking about more so is the kind of adventure itself, the lore, and really the story of the game. Now like I said in my review video, Zelda games are never really one for story, like they don't really have like super captivating narratives or anything like that. I think the best Zelda game in terms of story that I would say is probably Skyward Sword. So I wasn't expecting like some crazy narrative or anything like that inside of Tears of the Kingdom, but I was expecting there to be more kind of like connections and similarities and kind of references and things to stuff about Breath of the Wild since it is actually considered to be a sequel to the game. And so that's what we're going to be talking about inside of this video because there's a couple of things here with the game that I just find to be very interesting design choices when making Tears of the Kingdom and it really kind of makes you wonder why they did that and I do have an explanation as to why I think that the reason is for them doing this so we're going to talk about that towards the end of the video as well. Now I should mention that there is going to be spoilery stuff about Tears of the Kingdom and Breath of the Wild inside of this video so if you aren't finished with any of the games and you don't want to know that type of stuff definitely go ahead and play the games first and then come back to the video. So in Tears of the Kingdom, a lot of the mysterious stuff that happens throughout the game can actually just be explained by the upheaval, which is the event that happens in the intro of the game where Hyrule Castle rises up into the sky. So all of these sky islands that are appearing now, stuff falling out of the sky in terms of like those ruins, the gloom that appears with the mysterious craters taking you to the depths, the shrines, all of that happening is just because of the upheaval. Basically everything that happens beneath Hyrule Castle from the start of the game, that's kind of just the reasoning that the characters give for what happens happens in the world. But what I found really odd about this is how there's some stuff from Breath of the Wild that has just completely disappeared in Tears of the Kingdom without a single trace and there's no explanation at all. The first one is the Sheikah Shrines that Link went through inside of Breath of the Wild. There were so many of these Sheikah Shrines all throughout the game and of course if they still had them inside of Tears of the Kingdom's world as well, they wouldn't be active or they wouldn't work but then you also have all of the new shrines that are created too so it would have gotten way too cluttered to have all the old ones just there for show and not have any use so I do understand that but I still think it's so weird that they kind of just all disappeared and there's no explanation or anything. Like I think it would have been cool if there was kind of some reasoning where maybe like the upheaval caused all of the Sheikah shrines to turn into like these old shrines from the past where like the first kingdom of Hyrule was from and it has all the stuff with like Raru's blessings and all of that inside of there. Like I think they could have definitely kind of played around it and then had like the new shrines take place of the old ones. Something along those lines would have been pretty cool but instead it's just the old shrines are completely gone and there's nothing about them left. 
Similarly, the Guardians are completely gone from this game too, where anybody who has played Breath of the Wild knows that the most memorable enemy inside of that game was of course the Guardians that would be chasing you, shooting lasers at you, and they were pretty much all around the world, but in Tears of the Kingdom, they are completely gone and there is not a single trace of them left. They don't even have like rusted or broken down versions of Guardians that you can find in ruins or anything like that. Like they are just completely gone as if they never existed. The most surprising one to me though was the Divine Beasts. Of course inside of Breath of the Wild these were like the dungeons that Link had went through throughout the adventure and these were kind of tools that were used in order to beat Calamity Ganon at the end of the game where you had all of these divine beasts in the different corners of Hyrule and they would all be shooting at the castle and help you towards the end but the thing that's so weird about Tears of the Kingdom is that the divine beasts are just completely vanished from the world and there is no explanation or reasoning for why they don't exist. Like I can understand if they're not going to be used to beat Ganon again this time, but it's just so weird to me how they're completely disappeared from the world and it's not like that there's no like trace of them left either because there's literally one spot inside of Rito village where they actually mention something called Va Mado's perch and of course Va Mado was the divine beast that sat on top of it, but what happened to Vamado? Like there's no explanation, it's just not there. And I find that to be so weird because the thing about the Divine Beast that I feel like was such a missed opportunity was they even mentioned in Breath of the Wild how the Divine Beasts were dug up from underground. And this whole game has something crazy known as the Depths, so I think it would have been so crazy if like maybe when the upheaval happened it caused all of the Divine Beasts to sink into the underground and what if you could find like ruins of them inside of the Depths or something. It would have been so cool to discover that and especially if they were still big enough and you could traverse them like if you could go inside of them again and see all the broken down terminals and just maybe now it's all infested with gloom and enemies it would have been so cool but instead they just don't even exist inside of this game and there's barely any mention of them and the fact that they're not even there really just kind of makes you think like they had such significance inside of breath of the wild and if this is going to be the sequel to the game they just don't really even have any mention of them like it's just such a weird and odd decision now something else that I've seen some people mention is how there's some people inside of the game who have no idea who Link even is. And I find that to be so weird because of course in Breath of the Wild it made a lot of sense. Link woke up a hundred years later. A lot of people had no clue who he was. He was kind of clueless in the game. It made a lot of sense. But of course at the end of the game he basically saved Hyrule. Everybody knew who he was and you would think that he would be kind of known as like a hero now. And there are definitely people in Tears of the Kingdom who do know who Link actually is. Like I know Pura can easily recognize him right away. There's like important characters like Teba and Riju and Inobo and stuff. They do know who Link actually is. But then there's some people that it just makes no sense how they have no idea who he is. And the one that comes to my mind is Hestu. So Hestu was in Breath of the Wild for the same reason he's in Tears of the Kingdom and that's to help you expand your inventory space and so Link had already met him in the previous game and so you would expect him to already know who Link is and start asking him for Korok seeds but instead in this game when Link meets Hestu for the first time Hestu is completely clueless as to how Link can even see him and it's like they've never met before. And so it's just a little weird why they decided to do that. If I had to take a guess, I would say that it's probably because technically it's possible, I'm pretty sure, to go through all of Breath of the Wild and beat the entire game without meeting Hestu once. And so I guess if you're like the 1% of people who did that, you wouldn't know who Hestu is and that's why he wouldn't recognize you. But even that is like a whole other discussion that I'm going to have towards the end of the video as for kind of the design choice when making this game. But it's just a little weird because even if that was the reason, there's other characters who were optional that do recognize Link inside of this game so it doesn't make any sense. One of these characters is Hudson where in Breath of the Wild there's an entire optional quest line that you can do where you help expand Harrytown with its construction and you help bring more residents in there and so it's basically because of Link that the entire town gets to exist and everything and in Tears of the Kingdom that entire town is already there, it's already built and everything as if the optional quest was done from Breath of the Wild even though some people may have never done it but here Hudson's able to recognize Link right away and everything so it's as if the optional quest basically worked from Breath of the Wild so it's so weird how some characters do recognize him and some don't. Now when it comes to Ganon and Ganondorf, they actually did some pretty cool stuff here in terms of connections to Breath of the Wild where you can actually go back and look at some of the old cutscenes now from Breath of the Wild and they make even more sense now after Tears of the Kingdom so I'm actually really happy with that. Like when the first cutscene happens where King Rome is talking about Calamity Ganon and everything, he actually mentions how Ganon appeared from deep below Hyrule Castle which of course makes sense now because they basically trapped Ganondorf from beneath the castle so it makes a lot of sense as for why that's the case. And you 
can even find like little diaries and stuff inside of the castle where it talks about how for generations all the kings were told to never wander under the castle and now you know why so it's cool how they did stuff like that and they even mentioned that when Calamity Ganon first attacked 100 years ago, the magic that was binding Ganondorf weakened below Hyrule Castle when the castle was damaged. And that makes perfect sense now as for why in the intro sequence to Tears of the Kingdom, when Link and Zelda are walking beneath Hyrule Castle, when they get to where Ganondorf was sealed, that's why the arm that was kind of holding him is kind of a little shaky and it just falls off because it's already been weakened. So it's not like it was conveniently just happening there because the story needed to happen. There actually was a reasoning for that and it was based off of Breath of the Wild so I was actually pretty impressed with that. And it's really just stuff like that which I was hoping to see more of because it expands Breath of the Wild story while at the same time also just making Tears of the Kingdom so cool because of seeing how everything is connected and there just really isn't that many of those types of moments. It's just so weird because even before Tears of the Kingdom came out, Nintendo uploaded this video about Breath of the Wild called The Story So Far and they were hyping it up by saying like, learn the story about Breath of the Wild before you go into Tears of the Kingdom as a way to kind of make it seem really exciting like there was going to be a really cool continuation and a big connection and everything. When in reality, after looking at this video again and just seeing everything, I'm just looking back now after playing Tears of the Kingdom and I'm like, what was the point of this video? Like. There isn't anything in Tears of the Kingdom after playing through the entire game where I was like, wow, I'm so glad that I knew this from Breath of the Wild, besides the little Ganondorf thing that I mentioned earlier. And it's really because of all of this that, in my opinion, to me, I just don't really even see a reason to play Breath of the Wild anymore. Like, if somebody came to me now and said like, you know, Arrow, I want to get into these Zelda games that everybody's playing, these open world ones on the Switch, I think I would just tell them to play Tears of the Kingdom. Like there isn't really any crazy story or anything like that that I would say that they would need to play Breath of the Wild and then play Tears of the Kingdom to see how everything connects and how cool it is because it's it's so minuscule. Like really the only thing is just like that Ganondorf thing that I mentioned where you could just talk to somebody about that and explain it where you don't really need to play all of Breath of the Wild and then get like super shocked at that happening in Tears of the Kingdom. So. I don't know, man. It's just it's it's just a little weird to me because there isn't that many connections or anything like that in terms of the actual continuity from Breath of the Wild moving to Tears of the Kingdom. Like even in the recap video, they talked about the champions from Breath of the Wild and everything. And of course, the champions are long gone, so I wasn't expecting them to appear inside of Tears of the Kingdom. But even the mentions of them are just so minuscule that it really doesn't matter. It's more so just like a name where if you recognize it, you're like, oh, I know who that was because I played Breath of the Wild. Like there's an area in Zora's Domain called Mifa Court. There's an area in Rito Village called Rivali's Landing. If you read one of Riju's diaries and mentions Lady Urbosa, things like that, where if you played Breath of the Wild, you're going to be like, oh, I recognize who that person is but it's not really like anything crazy or connected with what's actually happening in Tears of the Kingdom. So let's talk about the why. Why did the Zelda team do this? Why did they erase things like the Divine Beast and the Guardians and everything from Tears of the Kingdom and not really have that many connections to the previous game or anything like that? And I think the answer to this can pretty much lie from this message that we have from the developers when the game first came out. <laughs> Tears and so you can see right there in the message from the Zelda series producer, Mr. Eiji Aonuma, he talked about how they put a lot of effort into making this game still approachable for new players. And I think it's because of that effort that a lot of this stuff from Breath of the Wild is kind of just erased inside of this game because they didn't want to confuse new players or people who may be picking this up for the first time. And so I can understand that that's probably the reason why they did a lot of these decisions, but it does kind of suck for anybody who did play through Breath of the Wild and was going into this game as it is hyped up as a sequel to the game, expecting to see a lot of connections and stuff. And I feel like this is really kind of a thing now that a lot of sequels are kind of just starting to do, where they're making the sequel still approachable for people who have never played the previous games. And it's because of that that they take out a lot of the connections and cool stuff for people who did play the originals. And it's because of that that I feel like it really kind of takes away Way from getting an even better experience so i'm personally just not a big fan of any developer who does this when it comes to sequels in fact there's another video game series that i'm very passionate about that did something very similar to this as well and that's the xenoblade series 
So last year, Xenoblade Chronicles 3 was announced, and they said that this was going to be tying together the futures of Xenoblade 1 and Xenoblade 2, and was going to be like the conclusive ending to the trilogy, which got so many people very excited to see how everything was going to connect, and how cool of an ending it was going to be. And when we got the developer's note from Tetsuya Takahashi, he mentioned how this game was going to be great for fans of Xenoblade 1 and Xenoblade 2, but they also put a lot of effort into making it approachable for people who are going to be playing this as their first Xenoblade game. And so when Xenoblade 3 came out, it was an incredible game and a lot of people really loved it, but the one thing that a lot of people were talking about though, was how it felt like there wasn't really a lot of cool connections or lore to the stuff from Xenoblade 1 and 2, which was weird because they advertised this as like the conclusive trilogy finisher that this game was going to be, and while it was an amazing story as its own standalone game, it really felt like they kind of did that so that a lot of people who didn't play Xenoblade 1 and 2 could still play this game and have a lot of fun out of it, but for the people who did play Xenoblade 1 and 2 and were hoping for there to be more crazy connections and lore tie-ins and have everything connect nicely, that stuff really just kind of wasn't there. And it definitely seemed like they did that to make Xenoblade 3 kind of its own standalone game so that it could still be enjoyed by people who didn't play the past games. Now for Xenoblade, I can actually understand this. The game is still considered to be like a niche JRPG, there's not a ton of people who play the game, so they're not extremely popular, and at this point they still just care about trying to get as many people as they can interested in the series for the first time, so they try to make the games as approachable as they can for everyone. In Zelda's case though, over 30 million people played Breath of the Wild, and these are going to be the same people who are going to be playing Tears of the Kingdom if they liked the first game, so it's just so weird to me how they tried to take out so many things from Breath of the Wild in terms of these connections and making the game still be approachable for new players, when so many people already did play through Breath of the Wild. Thankfully though for Xenoblade 3, we actually got an incredible DLC called Future Redeemed and this was full of the amazing stuff that people were hoping for with all the crazy connections, they brought back beloved characters that people loved, they had really crazy like connections to all the stuff that happened with the previous games and so that was the stuff that everybody was hoping to see so instead they made it into its own separate little mini kind of adventure inside of the DLC and so it was really cool how they did that and it finally kind of answered everything that people were hoping for. And so part of me really wishes that they would do something like that for Tears of the Kingdom, where there's like this awesome DLC that connects everything to Breath of the Wild and they talk about what happened to the Divine Beasts and the Guardians and all of that, but I'm not really expecting that to happen. I don't think that the Zelda team would do something as crazy as that, but it would be really cool. But yeah, I mean, that's really kind of just the only thing that I'm not a big fan of, but you can see here that all the stuff that I did talk about in this video, while it does kind of suck, and maybe some of you even agree with me in the fact that it does kind of suck that there isn't really a lot of those connections and things to Breath of the Wild, it still doesn't take away from the fact that Tears of the Kingdom is still an incredible game on its own, and honestly, I feel like if people just played Tears of the Kingdom by itself without having played Breath of the Wild and going in wanting these types of connections or anything, I feel like they might get an even better experience than somebody who did play Breath of the Wild. So yeah, it's just something that I wanted to talk about. Obviously, what I say isn't really that important or anything. It's just something that I wanted to kind of talk about with my feelings on the game. I still love Tears of the Kingdom. I still think it's one of the best games that they've made for the Nintendo Switch and is definitely a Game of the Year contender, but I just really wanted to talk about this. And so yeah, that is pretty much everything that I wanted to talk about, about my personal biggest problem with Tears of the Kingdom. If you guys enjoyed the video, definitely be sure to click that like button, and also subscribe to the channel as well, as I'm going to be having more Nintendo videos very soon, so definitely be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on that. But also comment down below and let me know what you guys think about all of this as well. Do you guys agree with me in the fact that there could have been some more of these cool connections and things to Breath of the Wild, or do you disagree with me? Definitely be sure to comment down below and let me know. Go follow me on Twitter at Actual Arrows so you can be featured in videos and also join my Discord server as well. We've got a bunch of people in there who are always talking about Pokemon and Smash Bros and Nintendo. So definitely be sure to join that. And remember to enter my giveaway as well. I am giving away a $55 Nintendo eShop gift card. So definitely be sure to click the link below in the description or the pinned comment if you want to have a chance to win. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for watching.